Great. Thank you so much. So uh, we're, Joseph and I are glad to be here today to talk to you about our um, two different approaches we have taken to help to have initiatives to get textbook costs down for our students here at UNCG and East Carolina. So first of all, I uh, want to just go over real quickly what, if you're still asking a question, so what are open educational resources? And the definition that most people have are that, you know, this is from the, the Hewlett Foundation, that these are things that reside in the public domain that can be used um, and used freely and repurposed by others. So the big five frameworks of um, open resources are that you can retain them, you can reuse them, revise them, remix them, and redistribute. So if it's truly an open education resource, you can do all of these things. You can take something and change it up or use it the same way and also be able to, do, to retain it for yourself. A bunch of different um, things qualify as um, open education resources, including curriculum, syllabus, course materials such as um, textbooks, labs, journals, ebooks, tools, all those lots of different things out there. A good example of a tool would be that percentage calculator that I always go to online when I have to figure out how, how much something is going to cost me from last year to this year. So those kind of things are available. So um, real quick, I'm hoping this works. We'll see if it does. Um, I'm going to show a quick video of what UNCG students thought about um, the high cost of textbooks. And what we did was we just asked them five questions and they answered them. So when, you, when the video starts, the first question you'll just see and then you'll start hopefully hearing the um, students speak. So let me see if I can get this going. Do you see it? No? Oh. It's not, it's not showing up on the yes, screen. Yes, very surprised. It was a lot more expensive than I yes. thought it was going to be. For lack of a better word, flabber. Can't see it. We, we couldn't see it. We could hear it. Okay. This is, all right. Beth, is there a way you could put the link in the chat and maybe, uh, or um, it's, it's a good chance that maybe uh, YouTube is opened up as one of your applications for possible sharing. I bet you the reason it didn't pop up was we were sharing. Perfect. Yes. I, I, you got it now? Do you see it? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, let's start it over. I knew they'd have, it's hard to do all this stuff. <laughs> yes, very surprised. It was a lot more expensive than I thought it was going to be. For lack of a better word, flabbergasted. <laughs> um, yeah, when I first started, I was definitely surprised. Didn't expect to pay that much for a single book. As a science major, it costs, they're really, really expensive. And they're worth almost nothing when you try to sell them back. Sometimes I don't, unless I know that a big project deals with that textbook. I only buy them if I really, really need the book. When I was a freshman, I did. I don't uh, sometimes because the prices are a little hefty. <laughs> if I had to buy them myself, I don't think I'd be able to afford like any of them. But I do just because my parents buy them for me. I've learned to kind of wait a week or two before I actually buy it. One hundred dollars? One hundred and fifty dollars. Like almost two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars, I think. And that's part of the access code thing. Probably is close to three hundred dollars for a chemistry textbook. Three hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah. For an access code. With my English class, I had to buy too many books and I ran out of money. It's made it difficult because it's one, you have the stress of getting the money to get the book for the class. I think college teaches you to be resourceful, so even if I didn't have it, I would look. I try really hard to get the notes from someone or at least like photocopy the book if I can't afford it. I like shop around a lot, like Chegg and Amazon. I try to get all my textbooks from online, like Amazon or Chegg. Uh, well, I don't buy them. 
Uh, let's see. I'll try to look it up on the internet or Amazon. I get them from Amazon. I go on Amazon. Um, usually I'll reach out to friends, especially within my major, if they've had the book in the past and maybe borrow it from them or go online to um, websites and just see if they have it cheaper. Okay, so let me get back to sharing my desktop again. Do you see the research on cost of textbooks? All right, so now we can keep continue. So um, one of the reasons that we really are trying to do some different things on our campuses for open education and, and resources is because of what we know from the um, Census Bureau that education books, the cost of textbooks have increased more than even medical cost. And we all know how much medical cost and new prices, everything has gone up. But the cost for um, school and educational books has really risen. Um, I just, I love this cartoon. It just shows about how the students <laughs> come home uh, <laughs> with a big load of debt when they get out of school. Um, I like, the quote at the bottom, I stopped buying textbooks my second semester here. I think people learn quickly, try to do something else or even share textbooks. There's a lot of that going on now. Um, this is the reality of that cartoon. The average of Bauer at least owes 28,000 or almost $29,000 in student loans. Um, and this debt is always delaying people to even have you know, do things like get married or own property or do something. So um, when students have that kind of loan, it's really hard to get that paid down the, when you first get out of school. And then another survey came out in um, 2016. Um, this was 5,000 students were surveyed and almost 30% of them said they used financial aid to pay for their textbooks. So that means they, they're paying additional money for a textbook um, and, that, and it's getting put in their loans. Also with students that are paying for fi with financial aid for their textbooks, sometimes their financial aid checks don't come in at the first of the semester. It, they come in a little bit later and they, have, they could be two weeks behind on their um, class studies when they don't have the textbook to work with. So why does affordability matter? Of course, we've talked about um, the growth of inflation and textbook cost is about an average of 1,500. A lot of this is access. Six out of 10 students, and this was from a survey done in Florida, did not, um, went without the textbook because of the cost. And 49% uh, take, you know, fewer classes because of that. And then the biggest performance issue, of course, you can see is they dropped the course because it was a textbook issue or they failed because of the textbook. So those are very interesting things um, that this is why affordability and trying to get the cost of textbooks down is important. So this is a, just an example of a textbook I have in the bookstore here at UNCG. It was a physics textbook. When you look at the prices, you can see buying it brand new is 241. To rent it is a, still $108, which is crazy because you have to return it and you don't have anything after that. You can't resell it or anything. So, you know, they're always like, well, we can rent the books, but they're still with the problem of they don't have anything when they're done. They've spent all, all that money and still don't have anything in return. In another, this is a good example of a college physics textbook, like the intro to college textbooks from the Open Textbook Library, which um, is a link that will get you to the OpenStax. OpenStax is a out of Rice University. It's a site where um, they have decided to concentrate on tw the, the top 25 um, freshman courses that have that you know, that a lot of people take, you know, the big classes like intro to psychology, intro to physics, chemistry, and they have um, put these books out there for free for faculty 
to use and students to use. And you can see that they could, they could actually, if they wanted to, order a hard copy in color for $48. And that's a lot better than that $108 just to rent a book. So there are some options that are starting to come up, and this um, there's a lot more of these being uh, published almost every month. There's a new book coming out. So at UNCG, we set up a LibGuide for OERs, and it's uncglibguide.com OER, and we, we're providing support there, and we have links to different kinds of um, OER issue, you know, things we have available, and um, we have videos to help faculty. We also have a place for them to find things that they need. So, well, um, Joseph, it's your turn. <laughs> All right, so as soon as you... Oh, I'm sorry. I have to stop. I have to share. Okay. <laughs> you go ahead. Um, let me... Sorry, I need to go ahead and start the screen sharing. Okay. All right. Uh, Beth and I are in um, year one of a two-year grant that was funded by LSTA uh, to combine two different um, textbook programs, alternative text programs, one of them related to OER and the other related to course adopted e-textbooks or CATs. And so I'll, I'll talk about part of that with the CATs and Beth can come back in to talk about the other part with um, OER and um, mini grants to faculty. So what counts for these alternative textbooks? Um, the course adopted texts are uh, regular textbooks, regular assigned textbooks that we purchase here in the library. Um, We're also looking for faculty members um, to use the articles and eBooks and books that we purchase. Uh, they can be freely accessible, like, um, I mean, open access textbooks, like the um, physics book that Beth showed just a few minutes ago. But the um, common denominator here is that these materials are freely available to students. So, um, the open.org and the Open Textbook Library, um, Beth mentioned the Open Textbook Library, those um, will provide open access books for uh, professors to use. But um, our library has also purchased uh, required textbooks, including the, some of the ones you see there, like a um, uh, set of uh, short stories by Octavia Butler or an encyclopedia by Jan von Brandt. Um, and the Job Search Handbook for People with Disabilities is another required textbook that we have that we were able to purchase using our uh, regular vendor. So in terms of the, what kinds of classes use these um, course adapted textbooks, uh, they can be both lower level and upper level classes. Um, it tends to be a little easier to find books that we can buy for the upper level courses where they're using something specific like that, um, like that encyclopedia rather than generic introduction to biology because you know uh, the introduction to biology uh, publishers aren't gonna sell those to libraries. Um, wide range of uh, subject areas from anthropology to theater and they can be for both on-campus and distance ed classes. Um, we get a list from the bookstore. Um, they were reluctant partners at first, but now they do willingly participate. Uh, they send us a spreadsheet with all of the required uh, textbooks, and it includes uh, inf bibliographic information about those books. And this is not new. Uh, in the past, our ILL office would not borrow required textbooks, so they were in the habit of getting a, a list of required textbooks already. And we just repurposed this list so that we can try to buy required textbooks. Um, the raw list does need to be cleaned up, though. Um, there's a lot of experience information in there, uh, you know, so we we're taking out all the lab coats and calculators and the notes that say no required textbook. Um, there are also some problems sometimes with edition listings or ISBNs, but um, we search our list in Cirrus Solutions and Gobi, the vendor platform, to see what we have access to already and what we can buy. Um, we send, we try to get buy-in from the faculty members. Um, you know, we, we let them know that the bookstore will still stock 
printed copies of these books. The students will be able to buy them if they want to use print copies, but the students will also have available to them an electronic copy that they don't have to pay for. And there's no excuse. They're, they're not waiting for, um, they're not waiting for their financial aid money to come in. They, they have the book available to them. There's no excuse not to do the reading. Uh, there are a few faculty members who have said they would not want to participate because um, they say things like, I want the students to bring the book in class and um, underline and make marginalia that I direct them to, or uh, I feel like this book is one that they're going to need for their future classes, and so I want them to buy it and keep it. So, they, you know, a few faculty members have turned us down. Um, we would purchase that item just like any other ebook. We activated in Serial Solutions to make it available through the ebook portal that we have, and um, we record that information in a LibGuide, which is arranged by uh, department. So, you, if you want to know what English classes have ebooks available through this, you can you can go to the box for English classes and see what books are there available, and then we put it through the regular cataloging practice. So uh, for the fall semester 2016, for both ECU and UNC Greensboro combined, we expended a little over $13,000 and we made nearly half a million dollars in maximum potential savings. Um, and that's a pretty good return on investment, we think. Now, the way we calculated the maximum potential return on save, uh, maximum potential return is, we said if all of the students who were enrolled in the class bought the new book, this is how much they would have spent. We know that not all the students buy the book. We know that they don't all buy new books. We know they do other things like sharing books or renting them or whatever. But, you know, for those circumstances, this would be the maximum. And um, that $13,000, um, we had some books that we owned already. So we didn't purchase 352. We purchased more like uh, 150 or so. So we already had other books, uh, but with that program for the fall semester, we provided access to 352 books for 436 class sections, 289 different professors, and nearly 12,000 students. So that's a lot of professors, a lot of students. Um, we've, we feel that the reach is expansive and it's only going to grow as the books get reused in future semesters. And as the professors, those 289 professors, you know, we hope they'll come back to us next semester and say, hey, I want to use this, this other book for my next class. Can, can you buy this one too? Uh, and we've had a little bit of that already, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So what we've learned, um, editions matter, you know, um, and we, we really can't get the course access codes, so we, we try to avoid those uh, books that require course access codes. Um, the EBL concurrent license has worked um, so far, but that, that really is best for small classes. Uh, we did recently have a, a case where the, um, we've reached the limit on our concurrent license number of users uh, because it was a large class with multiple sections. And so we've had to buy a, uh, an unlimited license for that book. Um, our preferred providers would be someplace like JSTOR or Project Muse where there's uh, the least DRM possible. But um, other than that, we start looking at the aggregators. Where do we have most of our eBooks? Um, there are always going to be titles that fall through the cracks. You know, maybe the title wasn't listed um, on the course book requisition when it was due, or maybe um, somehow in our searching we just missed that we were able to provide one book or, or another. Um, and we do have to remember to count the repeating, uh, the, the savings uh, when a uh, course uses the same book in future semesters. There's a kind of a snowball effect there. So for the future, you know, um, what we hope is that um, there will be, that we will own more and more, a larger share of the books that are used as required textbooks so that we can start looking at, at um, smaller classes or more specialized circumstances. You know, would, would we be willing to buy a, a three user license for a small class? Um, and I'm interested in making our LibGuide into something better, you know, maybe some sort of database driven, uh, or maybe we can combine um, the CATs that we currently list with the OER that professors are using through the mini grant program somehow. So um, that's what we're thinking about for the future. And then I'll turn it back over to Beth so that she could talk about the, um, the mini grant programs. Okay.
All right. Can you see that? My screen again? Are we good? Okay. So, uh, so what we did at UNCG is a little different. Um, we decided to try to give some mini grants and little like incentive stipends, 10 stipends for faculty to either go with an open access um, resource like something that's found on OpenStax or some other place. Also, encouraging, encouraging them to use library licensed and owned resources because um, we all know we pay a lot of money for um, licensing and owning resources that, and the, so they, we, we hope that people will use them. And then also if a faculty member wanted to create something of their own, um, the stipend was there to help with that. So the stipends were, um, we gave 10 out and they were $1,000 each. And the money was uh, sponsored, the, the, the provost office and the university libraries came together and each put in 5,000 each to, to come up with the 10,000. So, um, so we're able to give out 10 stipends. So the timeline on this was we had a forum where I was at, brought in Nicole Allen from Spark, who is um, nationally known for um, open education resources advocate, and she just you know talked to the faculty about the cost of textbooks, and and then we announced at the forum that we were going to provide these incentives, and then we had the incentives. Um, the application was announced, and um, this was the best part. As a, it's one of those things that. It, doesn't seem big, but it is. If you get either your president or your office of provost to send out the email, people actually look at it. <laughs> they might not look at it if it comes from the library, but if they usually try to click it and open it if the provost is sending something out. So um, we did some announcements that way, and we also did announcements in our Campus Weekly and other things. So um, a, in, the, in April, we had our workshops and 45 faculty attended. So that was a lot. I was excited about that. And then um, when the applications came due in, at the end of April, we had 25 applications. So there's only 10. So that was kind of sad. I had to um, tell several people that thank you for your application, but um, it did not make the cut this year. So what we did was on those applications, we had a rubric that we followed and ha I had like several um, I had two librarians and then uh, two faculty members um, work, work on reading over the grants and um, getting their input. And then I just used the rubric with the numbers and came up, you know, with the people that won the awards. And then um, emailed the grant winners. And also that email contained like information about who their library contact was, who would, you know, they might want to talk to because here at UNCG we have, you know, subject specialists for each area and, and department. And then we also have instructional technology consultants that come in and help can help people with online um, integration with their um, their classroom modules like Canvas and Blackboard and Moodle. So we have those um, available and I gave that information to the, the, the winners. And then in August and September, I met, this was, so in the spring, they got the award, they had all summer to work on it, and then in August, I met, in September, I met with each uh, winner to talk about what they were going to do, how they were going to do it, and then, um, you know, got some input from them about their class, and then late November, early December, I went back and talked to them, we had met with, the, with them, and then they, we, I wrote up some cost savings information and then uh, got, you got that information out. And the, the faculty, it was so fun because when you saw them in August, they were so excited about changing their class, doing something different. And then December, they were so excited because it worked and they were happy with what the outcomes were. So all 10 were very happy with their outcomes. I didn't have anybody say this was horrible. <laughs> so um, they were really happy about it and were glad to share the news and to tell people about it. And so um, then we shared this news out in the faculty forum with our winners to talk about their experiences. And I think that was one of the 
the best days I had to listening to all, you know, at least I could, I got six faculty to attend and talk about their experiences and they were, you know, it was really a fun forum for everybody. So here's a screen that shows you the kind of courses that um, won these awards and who, what they, their savings for the classes were. And it was all over the board. We had graduate students in, in a class. We had chemistry, art, anthropology, business. And um, so you can see that, and it's just, and like um, we said, these were potential savings. These, if the faculty, if the student had bought the, you know, the first book that was $154, that's how much savings they would have um, saved with all the students in the class. So, and my favorite is down at the bottom, the English 101, because guess what, guys? That's the big class on on everybody's campus. And they took the, just a simple $65 textbook that they had been using on writing. It's pretty one the standard writing style guide and they changed that and made a, a a nice module of links and things in their canvas to take a place of that and it was really cool so that they were that was the big winner there so our big investment is 10,000 so our return was pretty good you got you know return on investment was you know 204 dollar four two hundred and four thousand um, dollars so not not a bad and the average cost for most of the textbooks were around hundred and eleven dollars so I wanted to give you an example of one of the things that one of our doctor uh, in anthropology did um, he instead of using an expensive textbook he used this app that's free it's um, essential skeleton and so and and they also, the class as a whole created bones they, with a 3D printer and, um, and had them uh, print out. And so this class was helping create these objects. And so he was really, um, really cool idea that he had. And then the faculty, this is their thoughts on the um, OERs. I like this one. Um, Jennifer is in art and, and she was one that found that she liked this, this better than the textbook. And then we had Chanel James, who I just love. She's a great teacher and she was just gonna do it for one class, but ended up doing it for all her classes. So I've, she is now my champion on campus. And then um, also the, my favorite quote of this one was from my, our, our Heather Helms, when I love that. You know, Kids chat, clapped and cheered. <laughs> I don't think people get that the first day that they have a course in the morning you know, when they start with students on the first day of classes. So here are some student quotes from the, um, we did a survey at the very end of the class and the faculty put it on their, their canvas and you know had asked their students to fill it out and this is the um, information they sent back and um, you know they liked it. You know, you know, thought it was relevant, up to, more up to date, um, definitely less expensive, and things like that. And of course, I would say 98% of the students were really happy with um, on this the survey. But you always have that 2% that um, were like, I wish I'd had you know something different, so or a text. So um, I think the majority were always happy about it but you know there's always that outlier that has in maybe they have a different way of learning styles so they will maybe you'll have to work on thinking about how to do that better this time so our next steps um, Joseph and I had a grant uh, well Joseph did all the work <laughs> um, go ahead and talk about our grant a little bit Joseph sure okay yeah, this is a, a two-year um, grant. We're in the middle of year one. Uh, we both purchased the um, course adopted text for the fall semester and the spring semester, and we're both running the mini grant programs. Um, we've we've actually both campuses have had the forums for faculty members to try to generate interest, and we'll be awarding mini grants uh, for the work to be done during the summertime, and the courses to be taught next academic year. 
Um, now the, the grant between uh, the grant and our match, uh, we have 16 mini grants per campus uh, for these spring awards. And um, we've just uh, sent in the year two application for the grant. Um, we'll, we'll try to do 16 awards uh, for each campus again next year as well. Um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But we, you know, we've both had experience with both the CATS now and the OER mini grants, and we're, we think that we're on a roll. Uh, we also wanted to uh, give a teaser that there was a general administration call for proposals um, and one of the options was called actualizing innovations meant to scale and um, there were uh, the library directors from uh, UNC Greensboro and ECU and the scholarly communication librarian from NC State uh, were, were co-PIs on the grant and what this grant will do will be to provide uh, an open textbook network membership across the UNC system and to allow us to set up some uh, learning opportunities so that we can uh, share knowledge across all campuses in the UNC system. So that's that's a way that we hope to involve, uh, get lots of people involved across the system in this. So our, um, so if you want to know what's going on nationally or some links here, and this will be, uh, of course, in the recording, but if you do want to have these slides, um, you could either email Joseph or I, and I, we can send them to you. Uh, but these are the national trends that are going on. There's, yeah, of course, I talked about the Open Textbook Library. There's also Open Library of Humanities, Open Stacks, out of Rice, the, uh, another big one is uh, Affordable Learning Georgia, where um, the whole state of Georgia is uh, working to try to lower the cost of textbooks and have incentives for their faculty, and the products of those incentives are, are located there. And then um, there's uh, definitely different places to find lists of projects and policies ar around open access. So that is... Um, what we have to talk about and we'll take questions and just wanted to say here are some references from the stats that I gave out earlier and then and here's our emails so if you want to email us some questions or you know afterwards if you think of something after the the presentation today we can um, get back with you with some answers hopefully so I guess we'll, Emory will open it up for questions Oh, I have to stop sharing. No, um, Beth, do you, do you think the best way to uh, receive questions would be in the chat? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. That means I have to put my glasses back on so I can see it. Okay. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to start with the book. Um, there was a question. So I'm curious what you'd recommend for steps to get started with OER and open textbooks. Baby steps. <sighs> I, um, I think just maybe starting with educating faculty that these things are out there is a good way to get started. That's how I did it. I did a, like a forum to just educate people about where these things are. And if you're not sure where they are, if you go online and just start typing in open education resources and LibGuides, you will find tons of information from all over um, the country. How about you, Joseph? What do you think? Yep, that sounds good. Yeah, m many of us have OER LibGuides. Um, and, and this, one of the other things that I, I, I try to stress when I can is that this doesn't take away the faculty member's right to choose whatever is best for the class. Right. Um, we just want them to be aware that there are multiple options. They don't have to get locked into, you know, the, the, the Pearson conglomerate or whatever it is. <laughs> Yes, and we always put it in our in our emails when we send out uh, for the alternative textbooks that we send out the emails that the when the library buys them we were like, hey, we just we have these. This is just you know suggestion. It's not you know saying we have to. <laughs> it's just an alternative way for their fact their students to get to the, the information they need. Um, I think the second question is how would you handle the later editions? by every year, every other, and are you weeding earlier editions? Have you come across that yet, Joseph? We, we have not. We've been doing the CAP program for um, a couple of years now, 
Um, and I know that we will eventually face it, but um, so far it, it hasn't come up. Okay, and Lisa's asking, if a student wanted a hard copy of a book that is available online, how would that work? Uh, So, go ahead. <laughs> there, there are a couple of programs um, that are that are being developed now, where um, it's kind of uh, partnering up between, say, like OpenStax Network or other um, providers, like Barnes and Noble bookstores has their own program. I think it's called Xanadu, um, where it's essentially print-on-demand options for books like that. Um, some of the OpenStax books, uh, they've partnered up with Amazon, so that like that, that physics book, that's how you can buy that. Uh, for BC Campus, British Columbia, um, you can buy their uh, print-on-demand copies. Um, I have a copy of their chemistry textbook. Um, and so some of those print-on-demand options are coming around already, and um, we're, we're hoping that we can find a way to have a print-on-demand through uh, the university you know, printing and graphics is what we have here, University of Printing and Graphics, because they're the ones who do our course packs. And then the next question is, I'm curious about the library success was received by the university administration. Um, I will tell you that our provost is very excited about what we've done so far, and she has offered to do our matching for us with her funds. And I talked to her yesterday and I said, hey, um, I had 25 people show up for one workshop and like 20 to another, almost the same I, as I did the year before. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'll get a lot of applications this year. And she's like, well, if you think they might be wor worth, you know, giving, you know, doing more with, you know, talking to, to her, she said, please talk to me if you think that, that I can maybe find some more money to give you. So she's very proactive. And also, we both ended up with articles in our newspapers, local newspapers. And how about you, Joseph? Yeah, yeah that's true. The, the um, provost here is excited about it. He asked the library director about it. Um, we'll have to pester him for uh, some matches as well. Yeah, you could say, well, UNCG is doing it. <laughs> and then, um, how do you encourage faculty to attend the pre award workshops? Um, I I tried I did it at lunchtime. What time did you do it? Um, um, we also did it at lunchtime, and we got some of the uh, winners from last year's um, award to to come in and speak. So um, hopefully they would try to draw in some of the people that they know. And I um I did, I I I put it I advertised it in the you know the pay the the weekly. Uh, Campus Weekly that we have here. Also, the provost sent it out, uh, and a lot of people, and also, of course, sent it through our librarians, sent it out. I mean, pretty much anywhere I could go and say these workshops are happening, um, it was, and also, I actually sent them to the winners of the last workshops and said, Can you push this out to people you think might be interested? Because, you know, when they're talking to them, if they're talking about what they did in their class, they're going to tell another person and he might say that's kind of cool. And word of mouth kind of got it, got, got it out also. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? Well, let's see. Did I, I was going to go back up and see if I see any at the very top. This is that time <laughs> where it's like, okay, <laughs> it's Friday. I know everybody wants to go outside. It's pretty today. <laughs> if you do have any other questions, please feel free to um, email Thomas or me and um, Joseph and me. At um, we've got our emails on the on the um, powerpoints. Um, and um, in terms of other UNC schools doing programs like this, um, UNC Charlotte has a program to purchase required textbooks 
and NC State um, has awarded many grants um, for their faculty members. And th there may be others that we don't know about, but we know about those too. All right, well, if there are no further questions, we'll uh, go ahead and stop the recording now for our session.